Good day. I'm Jim Winship, Senior Diplomatic Correspondent for Diplomatic Connections Magazine. We're visiting today at the residence of the Portuguese Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Nuno Brito. Uh, he has served much of his career here in the United States, uh, including time at the United Nations uh, as well. And we're privileged to be able to sit by his fireplace and talk about uh, Portugal's experiences, its diplomatic policies, and particularly its relations with the United States. Ambassador Brito, welcome this morning, or perhaps I should let you do the welcoming since we're in your home, not mine. No, but it's, it's a pleasure, so I, I welcome you, and I'm quite ready to, to address your question. Uh, well, one of the places we'd like to start, because people are, I, I think, interested in uh, an ambassador's diplomatic career. Can you tell us just a little bit about how you decided to become a diplomat and then perhaps a bit about your training as well? Well, curiosity, you, you have a saying that says that curiosity, curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> and uh, I was trained to become a, a lawyer, um, but instead uh, I wanted to experience something about uh, you know, the world. And uh, so in our system, uh, Basically, diplomats are foreign service officers, uh, they are career uh, officers. So, we went through a, a very um, intensive uh, training, and also, um, uh, in, by the end of a two year experience, you are confirmed or not. And uh -huh. I, was, I was confirmed, and uh, I'm very happy that I was able to join the foreign service in all, all, all these years. In university, you trained as a lawyer before yes. your diplomat yes. training? I trained as a lawyer and uh, I became a, a diplomat. I, Almost immediately, I started dealing with the United States of America. It's my third time in this country. Uh, the first time uh, it was between, uh, during the Cold War years. I uh -huh. saw the Berlin Wall going down from Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then I came back between 97 and 2002 to work at the United Nations, uh, at our mission at the United Nations. Yes. Uh, we were there serving uh, our second mandate in the Security Council. And, um, and then uh, I moved back uh, in 2011. And so when I moved back, I had to reassure the US administration that I was not going to apply for a green card. So <laughs> <laughs> you had enough time built up that you could yeah. consider that. Yeah. And, and, and your, your point about uh, the Portuguese Foreign Service being professional foreign service officers, it, it's rare that there is anything like the political appointees to an ambassador's position that we see here in the United States. No, we have a different, uh, we have a different system, uh, very similar to the British or the French systems. It's the same tradition, and uh, we have been around as a foreign service for more than 260 years. And I'm proud to, to tell you that for the first time, uh, we are going to have a lady uh, soon appointed as head of the Portuguese Foreign Service our current ambassador to Vienna. And that's a very good uh, signal of the times and how we have changed and moved forward. Yes. Yeah. Well, certainly there's a long tradition of Portuguese exploration of the, the world and, and breaking barriers around the world in one way or another. Yes, it's true. Uh, we, I mean, we like to see uh, ourselves as bridge builders. Although in this world, I mean, in a more globalized world, I mean, the, the traditional diplomacy is no longer there. We have to cope with the new technologies, we have to, to, to cope with the instant information, we have to be more analytical uh, in order to serve better our, our own governments. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge. And uh, especially uh, in a case like ours, in which we use fewer resources uh, than other uh, services. But the advantage uh, lies in the fact that also uh, we are more targeted in what, uh, what we have to do. So. There is a balance, a trade-off. Yes, yes. We were talking before the interview started, and you showed me a calendar that had a, a reproduction of an advertisement or a postcard for yes. uh, of, of Portugal as the, the port closest to the New World, the shortest route to New York, the shortest route to South America, to, to Brazil. Uh, and Portugal often describes its foreign policy as Atlanticist. What, what does that mean, in fact? Well. There are three pillars in our foreign policy. Uh, for, uh, we are a European country, a member of the European Union. Uh, if you look at us, we are uh, integrated. Uh, the highest level of integration in the European Union, in all chapters, uh, we belong to them. I mean, yes. Uh, and uh, so we have a full 
the European Union member state, and that's uh, on a daily basis uh, a fact of life. Uh, the President of the European Commission, for instance, is a Portuguese yes. uh, citizen, Vice President of the European Central Bank, so the Portuguese uh, are very well connected with uh, the Union. But this is an important factor even for the US because it means that we have a table on, that uh, we are a member of the board. Yes. And uh, as you know, decisions in, for instance, in foreign policy and defense in the Union, and also fis fiscal issues are taken by unanimity. So that, that means that the voice of Portugal is as interesting as the voice of other member states. But yes, you are right. Uh, we are, if, if you look at the map, the most uh, the first friendly piece of land that you see in Europe is Portugal. <laughs> you have the islands, and then uh, the, to the west uh, and to the south you have Portugal. And uh, we have a very strong ties with the US. Um, and uh, we were, I think, that the second country that uh, has recognized that recognized their independence, um, taking aside uh, France because they were a member of, the, of your war of independence. And uh, we uh, also have had a very intense defense and security relationship with the United States of America since uh, the Second World War and um, in NATO, of which we are a founding member as well. So in that sense, we also look south because Brazil uh, is a very strong and powerful ally of Portugal. So we tend to say that we are Atlanticists because we look at not only at north, um, the north of northern Atlantic space, but also uh, at the Atlantic as a a common space. Yes. And on the other side, you have Angola, and Guinea-Bissau, and Cape Verde, and saint four countries which are Portuguese-speaking countries. They are Atlantic countries as well. So in this sense, we, we say that we are Atlantic uh, fully. So the Atlantic is really, you're building those bridges, if you will, across yeah. the Atlantic. To the Atlantic is our house, a common house, so to yes. speak. In, uh, but, I mean, we look also uh, globally. Uh, not only to other Portuguese-speaking countries, but also to other uh, major players in the world. And we have very strong ties with Japan, China, India, and other countries, which are um, out of our traditional uh, influence, so to, so to speak. Yes. yes. But they were all places you touched on historically in Portuguese explorations of the globe. And with China, as you pointed out, it's not been that long than Macau has been fully under Chinese sovereignty. Well, uh, it's true. It, it was a Portuguese, uh, it was a Chinese territory and a Portuguese administration. It never stopped being Chinese. Yes. Uh, but we had a very good uh, transition uh, period there and an agreement. And so, yeah, I mean, that has moved to, to at a different stage. What is important about our history is that we don't look at it. We are not uh, frozen in history. Yes. We want to use it. Uh, in, in a better way. I mean, we learned, have learned something from the countries with which we were in contact. We have learned a lot. If you look at our, uh, our, our food, our uh, traditions, uh, our politics, uh, you would be surprised to ask a Portuguese kid about, for instance, China. They will immediately point to its capital and other places. Why? Because it's in our uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Very. But now you mentioned three pillars, so the, the EU, the Atlanticist, and then what, the Portuguese community? The Portuguese speaking Global. countries, yes. yes. Uh, there is a, a community of Portuguese speaking countries, uh, which includes all of them. So uh, in South America, Brazil, five in Africa, East Timor, and the Far East, and, uh, and Portugal, of course, in Europe. Uh, but the Portuguese language has actually is one of the fastest fast expanding languages in, in, in the world at this point, uh, mainly not because uh, we in Portugal we have too many babies, but because <laughs> Brazil and uh, the African speaking countries are growing mm -hmm. from yes. the birth rate is, 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 is very high. And, um, and, so, and also because they are projecting their influence in the, in the areas in which they live. And, by the way, and, they're, and they're using Portuguese as their, their common language, as, as a opposed to whatever the local languages might be. True, and it's becoming also a business language. I mean, uh, uh -huh. it's not only a, a, a language for those countries, but it's becoming a business language in South America and uh, in other places. Yes. And so, and even in Europe, I tend to underline the fact that we, are, we have one of, the, one of the official languages of the European Union. So uh, that means that the documents of the Union 
the, the works, uh, uh, work of the institutions also uh, use Portuguese yes. <laughs> uh, as, as their language. So that's a very important dimension in the firms, you know, firm policy. You've served here in the United States multiple times, as you said. Going back to the, the last days of the Cold War, you were in New York at the UN for the 9-11 tragedy. What, uh, how do you think the United States has changed over your, your multiple residences here? Well, I feel tempted to, to, to ask for the use of the Fifth Amendment, but <laughs> I, will, I will use the we're first We're not going to let you plead the Fifth. <laughs> no. I will use the first one. No, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, it's not only the rest, the world has changed a lot. Uh, and that has changed not as a result of single events, although they were important events, uh, but uh, uh, as a number of factors uh, have globalized us, like the technology of new technologies, um, and um, the, at the end of the Soviet Union, the opening of, of uh, uh, all Europe yes. uh, afterwards. And I think that that has had an impact everywhere, including in the United States. But of course, I mean, uh, you are um, uh, adapting like we are to uh, the new circumstances, to the new world. But what, what is important to, to bear in mind for me as a, as a diplomat is the fact that uh, um, if there is something similar uh, to the US or you, it's Europe and vice versa. I mean, uh, yes. our values, our principles um, are still basically very similar. And I think that, that, that bonds us. Uh, very, uh, in a very special and unique way. Uh, so, uh, to, to go back to your question, I think that you are uh, moving fast, but the world is moving fast as well. So yes, it's, it's moving like, fast in order to even begin to keep up. Well, it's, uh, it's an interesting, a very dynamic situation. Yes. And of course, uh, from a political point of view, probably your debate is more lively now than it was when I was here before. <laughs> But the debate in my own country is also very widely. So. Yes, yes, yes. What, what do you think the impact, you mentioned the, the opening up of Europe, I mean the expansion of Europe after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, and the end of the, the so-called Iron Curtain, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. What do you think the, the impact on sort of the core countries of NATO and the European Union has been of that, that very rapid expansion in, in size, the inclusion of so many of the Eastern European countries in the Union or in NATO? I'm glad that you asked that question uh, because uh, that's a very important one. I mean, the fact is that nowadays if you look at Europe, you see to a large extent an integrated uh, Europe. Be it in the European Union, it's, it's interesting to note also that uh, nobody wants to leave the Union. Uh, and, uh, but a lot of, uh, of countries in, in Europe and even outside Europe uh, are trying to join us, uh, and uh, so that means that there is something in there that mm -hmm. has a failure. And uh, of course there is, uh, there are many things that have a failure. And uh, so the fact that we are uh, now 27, 28 members of Croatia uh, in the Union, and also we have some other candidates uh, uh, negotiating their accession to the Union is important. The fact that uh, NATO has expanded also, um, not less than the corner at the corner start of our, our defense and security policies. The, the, the summit in, in Lisbon and the summit in Chicago, the two, two summits were linked. Yes. They were very important uh, in the results that they have produced. But NATO uh, it, it has embraced its former enemies, I mean, the other bloc as well. And that's very important because it, it integrates Europe in a totally, and the Euro Atlantic area, in a totally uh, different way. It's a game changer, and, uh, and uh, so when people are feeling skeptical about Europe, I tend to remind them that uh, nowadays, for instance, I can go from Lisbon to Helsinki using the same currency, uh, <laughs> not showing my passport, and using even a common language, uh, which is at this point English, uh, of course, uh, 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 in a very, in a very, in a very easy way, I mean, and also. Notwithstanding our differences, notwithstanding our differences, we can solve them. We are solving them by negotiation. In the past, I mean, the history of Europe was totally different. Yes. Yeah, so, let me ask: As long as we're talking about about Europe, how do you see Russia's place in in 
the new Europe. You've talked about former enemies becoming uh, a part of NATO or become joining the, the EU. Russia seems to obviously to have gone through the collapse of an ideology of a system and yet to have come back to a much stronger nationalistic position. We see President Putin being President Putin uh, again. How do you think Russia fits into the European equation at this point? Well, uh, we have been forging, I mean, I'm talking about, about, about Portugal specifically. I mean, we, we have been forging very, very close ties with, uh, with, uh, with Russia as well. Uh, of course, there are two levels. I mean, the dialogue between the European Union as such, all the European member states, and Russia, and the dialogue between each one of the member states and Russia as well. I mean, probably uh, we are not burdened by the by, by, Common past, yes. because uh, we were uh, in the different side of the fence, yes. and so um, probably it's easier for us to to to, to talk uh, with them on a number of issues. But on the other hand, I mean, we we feel that there is a common approach uh, in Europe, uh, and I believe that Russia is interested also in building this relationship with, with Europe. It's uh, and it's moving. Uh, it's not only energy, as people sometimes say. It's very complex. I mean. Uh, from the security field to, to the energy field, but also there is a very strong dialogue uh, uh, going on on issues that are sensitive. They are a member of, of the Council of Europe, like yes. we are. So we can, in different forums, discuss with them different issues of uh, common interest. I mean. So uh, Russia is a, a key player for Europe, certainly. Let me take you back to your, your time at the United Nations. How? How did that experience of multilateral diplomacy influence you as a as a diplomat? I mean, it's a, it's a different proposition being part of that UN community in New York than being a representative to the United States, for example. Well, you know, in, diplomats can be lazy sometimes. When they have to serve in one country, uh, they tend to get addicted to to to, to the country. Yes, <coughs> but um, I'm sorry, but. Um, in multilateral affairs, I mean, if you learn to to understand diversity, to understand better why uh, a number of countries move in a different type of way than yours, I mean, uh, and, and actually that has enabled, uh, in my personal experience, enabled me to understand much better a number of issues, international issues, uh, that uh, would have been more difficult to get uh, without this cultural uh, background. So I think that the, the United Nations is, is a big unifier. Mm. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, people have illusions about what they can do. I mean, we, we are very pragmatic and we know that they can do what we member states want them to do. And, uh, and that, that, uh, that's um, sometimes difficult because yes. uh, the convergence of ideas is, is sometimes difficult to, 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 to be there. But uh, for instance, the High Commission for Refugees, one of the top jobs in the UN, is yes. a Portuguese citizen, a former Prime Minister also. And uh, so we work constructively in, in, the, in, the, in New York, in Geneva, in, uh, in Vienna, and all the UN uh, issues. And, uh, and uh, we have served three times in the Security Council. Uh, and I believe that uh, all the members, the permanent members, were pleased with uh, our approach, mm -hmm. and our constructive mm -hmm. and pragmatic approach. So it's different, uh, but uh, it, it's very helpful also to understand the, uh, the cultural issues in your own country. So it's a globalized, again, a globalized world. Much what is more global than the UN? <laughs> it is. It's an education to see yes. your country through the eyes of so many different yes. countries and to, yes. to work with diplomats on a routine basis from so many different countries. It, it, it is a different atmosphere, to be sure. The historic relationship between the United States and Portugal, and, and then perhaps what what are some of the, the current issues between the United States and Portugal? Well, uh, you know, it, it, there is someone said that there are not smaller big countries; there are smaller big ambitions. <laughs> and uh, my, I, have, I, I have to confess that my government has been very ambitious in the sense that we we want to to keep to update our relationship. Of course, I mean, what we we have done. So far, Portugal and the United States is important, but uh, what is important now is to broaden, in my perspective, I mean, our cooperation. I'm, I've been try, uh, doing a lot of work, uh, for instance, in connecting 
scientific institutions in the United States and Portugal. And uh, I, have, I have to tell you that uh, there are four US uh, Portuguese programs which are important, with Har Harvard Medical School, the MIT, um, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and also Austin, Texas. Uh -huh. And uh, I, top institutions and, uh, involving um, uh, hundreds of, of uh, researchers, scholars, um, hospitals, and other things in, 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 in my own country and in the United States. And like the feedback that I've been getting from them is very good. So, this is an area that is not very well known in the United States. Um, also, I mean, if you look at the economy, the third largest wind power company in this country is a Portuguese owned company. EDPR, uh, based in Houston, Texas, uh -huh. former Rio Horizon. Uh, they bought it and they have expanded and they are present in 11 states, if I'm not wrong. Uh, also, I mean, uh, uh, in the banking sector and in other areas, uh, we have been expanding. The trade between Portugal and the US has been growing steadily. Um, we are reaching uh, the the level that we had uh, before the crisis, uh, as you know, the trade has been slowing. Yes. And, yes. and, um, and uh, so, uh, all in all, in the last 10 years, we traded more with the United States than we traded with all the BRICS combined. And uh, that's an important indicator uh, as well. Um, the more so because the BRICS include Brazil. Yes, of course. Yes. Brazil, China, and uh, uh, well, and, uh, and of course, and our trade with, with China and Brazil is also expanding. Yes. But I'm giving you just uh, to compare <coughs> what we did in the last 10 years. <coughs> On defense and cooperation, we also are moving up because there are new challenges. I mean, it's, we are no longer facing the same kind of threats together, but there are new threats that we are facing together terrorism organized crime, drug trafficking, uh, failed states, uh, so piracy. Piracy was not even in our criminal code. That's Is that right? Uh, and, uh, so I guess given, given Portuguese long history of navigation, I'm surprised that piracy wasn't well, in your criminal code. Because it was eradicated. <laughs> so when it started again, I mean, we sent yes. uh, uh, Portuguese ships to the Indian Ocean. One of them was, uh, one of the, those ships was leaving the at some point, the, the NATO uh, force yes. in, in yes. the area, and uh, so we are trying to uh, adapt to the new circumstances in a, in a very difficult uh, financial environment. And, uh, and so I think that we have been working well with the US, even on financial issues, mm -hmm. um, not only through the IMF in Washington and European institutions, but also uh, talking directly to the US government on a, a number of issues. Of, common interest and uh, so all in all I would say that we have a very a very healthy relationship and of course the main factor uh, is not history, the main factor is the fact that uh, about according to your census 1.4 million uh, people in this country identify themselves or with Portugal uh, in one way or the other as Portuguese citizens or Portuguese Americans and I think that that's the anchor that mm -hmm. binds our countries together more than anything else. Now you've touched on a number of subjects that I, that I want to follow up on, but let me follow up with that, that Portuguese-American community. Where, where, where is it in the United States? Well, uh, I think that the number one spot is California. Uh, it's a, an old one, mostly from the Azores, but not only from the Azores, but uh, also in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, we were happy when, we were, when President Obama went to Lisbon in, in, for the Lisbon Summit. In 2010, uh, he recognized that uh, he grew up in Hawaii. Yes. He yes. knew something about our Portuguese food through the Portuguese Americans <laughs> in Hawaii. Uh, also, um, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. very traditional communities, and more recently in New Jersey, um, and expanding also in, in Florida at this point. So, uh, and of course, in New York, we have some people, but uh, like everybody else. In, in, in Texas as well? Or? Texas is important not because we have a Portuguese American community there, but because usually it's our second or first trading part, largest trading part uh -huh. in the US. Uh, basically, it's petrochemicals. Yeah, it was, it was energy related. Yeah. Yeah. We export uh, uh, refined products to the US. You have a deficit in your country on that, 
So we don't produce oil, but we import oil and we refine mm -hmm. and export it to the U.S. That's uh, it was a long tradition. I mean, Angola was a major oil producer, certainly. It is. Uh, uh, so, uh, but in the U.S., I mean, our presence basically is in these states. And, I see. Uh, and it's being felt across. I, mean, I think that the Portuguese Americans are pretty much like coverage Americans in all that. I mean, I'm saying this because it's becoming more integrated uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a community. And there are members of Congress, you were telling me, who trace their Portuguese heritage. There are three members in the, in the House uh, and one in the Senate. Uh, there, is a, uh, there are a group of friends, of course, like the Senate, because you cannot have a caucus there, but there is a Portuguese caucus in, in, in the House. It's going to be renovated, of course, because of the, the recent election. But also, what is it? for me important is to see a number of Portuguese Americans uh, in, the, in the local governments, I mean, uh, uh, as mayors, um, as members of yes. the uh, assemblies, uh, as uh, judges. Uh, I think that if I'm not wrong, the, the top judge, uh, justice in, in Rhode Island is from Portuguese origin at this point. One of the top judges is also in Massachusetts, Judge uh, Raposa. Um, uh, as entrepreneurs also, so it's a very dynamic and vibrant community. How do you as ambassador interact with that Portuguese American community around the country? Well, I, I go, they are, you know, they keep their own uh, meetings, their own annual traditions, their own, uh, and that's how I, I, they invite me and I go there, uh, as, I go out as, 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 uh, as much as I can. Um, and then when they don't invite me, I invite myself. <laughs> uh, so, but you get out of Washington a good deal. Yes, I get out of Washington. One of the things that I, th I feel that an ambassador should do in the United States is not to be confined to Washington. Yes. Because uh, if you want to talk about trade or about uh, culture or about other uh, politics even, you have to move up. You have to, you know, I've been trying to do that, to visit uh, other states and uh, and the, in, and the connections between the, the states and the Portuguese communities and Portuguese Americans are, uh, are, of course, my top priority. But I've been out of my comfort zone and, uh, <laughs> and visiting other places as well. Yeah. I'm going to be in Utah, for instance, soon. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very good. The, um, I think often when people think about diplomats, they think about the relationships with the between the embassies and the executive branch, with the State Department, with the Defense Department. But how do you as an ambassador interact with the Congress, for example? Well, I, I go there quite often because there are a number of issues of common interest uh, that, uh, that uh, require us to, to, to deal with, with Congress. I think that you, have a, you are a very open society, um, politically speaking. And uh, so, of course, we have to interact with the administration. It's our main interlocutor. But we have to, act to, to interact with the U.S. Congress, other federal institutions, but also uh, with the, the state institutions as well yes. as, as needed. I mean, uh, and uh, so it's a very decentralized system, and uh, we work well with it. Uh, I think that that's the only way. There is no other way in Washington. Yes. And of course, I mean, the civil society, I mean, the think tanks, and the, of course. the universities, the TV in, in general, uh, they are all, all of them important. As we sit here, uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta uh, is arriving in Lisbon. Um, can you tell us a little bit within bounds about his visit uh, and the, the agenda for the visit? He, I mean, the Pentagon said uh, in a statement that uh, he was going to visit a number of allies in, in, in Europe. We are very pleased to have him because uh, I think that Secretary Panetta probably it's his first visit to countries in Europe. I mean, Mm -hmm. as far as I understand, as in this current job. And uh, so that shows uh, for us uh, the political, how politically meaningful our relationship is with the US. Of course, there are some uh, issues that uh, we have to deal with, like for instance, uh, uh, the Afghanistan, the future of Afghanistan, but also bilateral issues like uh, uh, the military facilities that the United States have in, in, in Yes, but uh, also, I mean, uh, probably you are aware that uh, we have strike force NATO, uh, one of the NATO uh, components.
components uh, with a very strong US presence hold the uh, place in, in Wisdom yes. nearby. So that's all these elements show that uh, we have a um, productive relationship with the United States in, in these areas. I mean, of course, I mean, on, the, on the Azores, uh, we are dealing with um, scaling down uh, the number of people that you, you are having there, and of course, that has an impact in the islands, and um, we'll have to deal with that as well. But we do that always in a constructive way, and that's the good thing about it. Now, I, I have to ask, uh, there, there were rumors, at least, when it appeared that the United States might leave the base in the Azores, that China expressed interest in that, in that base. Any truth to that? Well, I've never, you know, I've never, uh, I've seen that, uh, that article that uh, was published by an American magazine. And, 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 uh, Public Radio has yeah. mentioned it, yeah, there are a number of guys. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I can tell you uh, truthfully that uh, uh, there is a lot of speculation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and it is a different world, as you, as you said. But right now the issue really is the, the economic impact of scaling down the base, is that right? Yeah, but uh, I mean, the United States are, um, are uh, an ally. We, we just don't have a relationship with the US as if it, it was a relationship with any other country. Uh, we have an alliance. I mean, and uh, not only in NATO, but also bilaterally. Uh, yes. Because we have a bilateral defense agreement with, uh, and security and cooperation agreement with the US. And so we don't forget that. And uh, we expect our American friends also not to forget, not to forget that. <laughs> so because. Uh, and having said that, I mean, uh, I, okay, I mean, I think that there was a lot, a lot of speculation uh, on that on that issue. But it was speculation. Understood. And you have participated in a number of, of international security um, operations. I mean, you have forces in Afghanistan. You've had forces in Lebanon, I believe. Yes, we were. We we tried to be present as much as we can according to our resources. Uh, for instance, in former Yugoslavia, at some point in Bosnia, the Portuguese unit was per capita the, the highest one uh, from the NATO country when the operation in Bosnia started. And we stayed there until the, the, the very end. Uh, in Kosovo, uh, uh, also, uh, we, we've been there uh, in, in Afghanistan, um, and also in other international uh, theaters like East Timor, uh, 10 years. Yes. Presence, uh, like in southern Lebanon, we have been uh, in support of the United Nations there. We supported the UN operations in Angola, in Mozambique, uh, um, and uh, in other places as well. As I said, I mean, uh, we try to act according to our resources, but to act responsibly. I mean, we feel that uh, a big part of, uh, part of a collective security alliance is not just a matter of words. You have to, to yes. do something from time to time. Maybe a little bit. We've been building up to it. We need to talk, obviously, about, about economics and the, the, the global economic situation, the global slowdown. But Portugal uh, has been particularly hard hit uh, with this. Um, let's start with it. You, you received a, a loan, uh, 78 billion euros, I believe, something like that. Um, slightly bigger now. Because slightly bigger. bigger all right, all right. I will. I didn't want to inflate the figure, <laughs> but um, from the European Union, from the International Monetary Fund, from the European Central Bank, um, what were the conditions of that loan, and, and what is Portugal's relationship now with those those three, the Troika as they're called, those three lenders? Well, uh, when we we do we, we first of all. I mean, when we started this process, uh, we wanted to make sure from the outset that we had, we had, it was our own process, that we had ownership of the process. So, yes. Meaning that we were nobody pointing the gun to our head and saying, you have to, to do this. Uh, it was a decision taken by the Portuguese uh, government at the time with support of the two, uh, two of the main political parties in the opposition. Those parties have no, are now in the government. And, um, and so um, the three, uh, three of, the, of the five top political parties in Portugal in the parliament supported, representing about 
we're going to purchase part of it, have supported this agreement. So, this is a very important um, uh, starting point if you want to analyze Portugal because the level of political stability uh, and cohesion in, in dealing with these issues has been very high. Having said that, uh, of course, there is a very lively discussion going on in Portugal about uh, the, how to implement some, not the agreement as such, because the agreement has been implemented by these three parties, uh, the former government, now in the main opposition party, and the other parties, but also uh, how to move uh, in the future, how to adapt it circumstances. And uh, the basic message that uh, my Prime Minister and uh, the Portuguese government have been expressing is that we want to, to, to fulfill all uh, the requirements of the agreement, we want to move on uh, in time, uh, meaning that uh, if things move as we expect, uh, in 2014 we'll be back to our own feet. Uh -huh. uh, and that's very important. Uh, politically speaking. And also, the key point is to go back to the markets, our ability to regain the, the trust and the confidence of the markets. And I think that we have been doing that. Uh, if you look at uh, the interest rates of, uh, of the loans that we have, have been getting, they are, they are lower now <coughs> uh, than they were uh, when we tried. And that, that lower interest yes. rate is a reflection of increased confidence in yes. Portugal's ability to stabilize its economy. But it's a very tough situation. I mean, uh, no, no doubts about it. We had to cut, uh, since 2010, about 13 billion euros in our current ex expenditure. Because this program, if, if you want me to, to talk about it, has basically three legs. One is fiscal consolidation, uh, and we are doing that. Uh, the, the second one uh, is um, and banking recapitalization, and we have also have done that. Uh, and the third one is the is growth, so the economic reform that we need in order, and that's the main challenge that we face: mm -hmm. how to make the Portuguese economy more competitive, more global, more uh, in, in in line with the challenges of the, of the yes. global environment. And that's that has that means reforms, and that's what we have been doing: reforming. Uh, um, our labor laws, uh, judicial system, uh, competition laws, um, among, other, among other things uh, that they could uh, point out. And that includes, of course, the privatization programs that we, we, we've talked yes. about. Yes. What is the impact of the austerity programs on the average Portuguese? I mean, there, there certainly have been concerns expressed, there have been some demonstrations, there are uh, people who are simply asking whether the social fabric of, of Portugal can hold together in the face of these, these rather dramatic uh, cuts in spending in social programs and so forth. Well, the impact has been very tough, as you know. Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, every, every single Portuguese citizen, one way or the other, is feeling the, the, the impact of, of that situation. And, um, and I believe that it's not only a matter of uh, money or resources, mm -hmm. it's uh, also, broadly speaking, a matter of something that has to do with the whole society. But <coughs> I'm proud to say that it has, I mean, uh, if you look at, you know, at the demonstration and so on, they are not unusual by Portuguese standards, and also they have been quite peaceful. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, we, we, again, we have a lively debate about what to do, how to move in the future, and so on. But that's part of our uh, democracy, our, of our, our fabric, as a, politically speaking. We have our own political institutions. They have a different saying about uh, current issues linked with reforms. <coughs> so we are not monolithic. Uh, Understood. But at the same time, we have been able to move forward. So, if you ask me, what's the main problem in Portugal now? I will tell you, unemployment, unemployment rate, <coughs> because it has, according to public statements uh, by our government, I mean, it has moved <coughs> probably higher than we were expecting to. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the big challenge that we face: to restart, to make our economy grow, in order to diminish debt. But on the other hand, on the other side, on the bright side. 
if you look at the fiscal consolidation, banking recapitalization, and also if you look at, um, for instance, our exports, you see uh, a lot of positive indicators uh, about the, the road ahead. Mm -hmm. So we need time. You cannot just cure the patient in 24 hours. It will take more time. And how do you think Portugal's experience has compared, for example, with Greece's even more dramatic experience? I, mean, I, I don't think that we can compare the two experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, they are different. I don't speak for themselves. So of, course, of course. But uh, I think that uh, it was a different situation in Portugal, like it was a different situation in Ireland or in other places. Uh, so we tend to, to look at our own case. That's a difficult case, but a case that we are going to solve yes. <laughs> in the end. And I think that uh, all the feedback that we have been getting uh, so far from our lenders, from the Troika, so-called Troika, uh, as you know, are very positive. So, yes. um, having said that, I mean, uh, we may have to adapt one thing or um, as we move on, uh, or the other, but we as Portuguese, what I can tell you as an ambassador of Portugal to the US is that as Portuguese, we have done what we had to do. Mm -hmm. Now, from a systemic point of view in Europe, uh, to, in order to stabilize the, uh, our common currency, steps, very important steps have been taken as well. And I think that we are, we are seeing a more stable situation across Europe now. And I, we feel that they'll, that will have a positive impact uh, in the Portuguese situation as well. Does Portugal feel that now that some progress has begun to be made, that perhaps loans or loan terms could or should be renegotiated, uh, or that there should be some new measure of debt forgiveness to help continue that process of reform? We have never uh, uh, adopted that line of. <coughs> we have said that we want to meet uh, <coughs> our obligations <coughs> and. Uh, of course, I mean, there are other questions. I'm sorry. <coughs> no, but you want to still uh, have some water. Then we have to, we want to meet uh, uh, our obligations, and uh, uh, even if, uh, for instance, we have to, re to review our targets for fiscal consolidation this year, uh, but that was do, uh, done uh, in agreement with uh, our, um, uh, our partners in the, in the, in the truck and in this exercise. Uh, because, I mean, we have to assess the impact of the, in a dynamic way of the measures that we take in our own economy. Yes. And that's what we did. But, I mean, that road that we are pointing is not the road that, that we have been saying that we are going to mm -hmm. fall. On the contrary, we say that we want to meet all our obligations, we are ambitious, uh, and we want to restructure the state sector in such a way that uh, it will prevent us in the future of facing similar situations. Yes. And part of that is, is privatization of some areas of the uh, Portuguese economy? Part of that is privatization, yes. Not only privatization, but uh, for instance, we want to cut the red tape. And we have been doing uh, the, and that. Um, we want uh, what we call the uh, electronic government, IGA. IGA. Uh, it has been progressing very well in Portugal, but not the uh, best in the uh, reforming the labor laws, so that was a key move uh, in Portugal because they were not competitive uh, in these days. Uh, reforming our judicial system in order to become it more business friendly. Um, by this, I mean, of course, uh, speedier in yes. is, uh, how they look at uh, the cases. And they have been doing some progress. Um, of course, they are in, an independent uh, body, but they are doing also operating in, in, in this area. Uh, and privatizations are part of the the old picture because we want to make sure that the state is going to be present where it should be. And, uh, and so we have privatized our main utility electricity company, uh, also the distribution network associated with it, the airports, um, among other things. Uh, we have uh, left completely the telecom uh, business, I mean, uh, from the state state point of view, uh, and also the main, um, um, the main uh, oil refining corporation. Uh, and uh, we are moving, and the next step, according to the government, I mean, uh, is uh, 
for instance, the Portuguese airline, the PAP, is yes. also one of the targets. Uh, among other areas that will be... Uh, so, for example, TAP will probably be privatized? And well, it's one of the top priorities for 2013, yes. Question, you mentioned the energy industry. One of, as it was privatized, um, China bought into EDP for about a 20% share, if I understand correctly. Um, does that give you any concern at all to have a, a Chinese, in this case it's the Three Gorges Corporation, I believe, that has such a large share in such a critical industry in Portugal? Well, our concern had not to do with any particular country. Our concern had to do with moving, conducting these operations in a transparent way and uh, being accountable uh, from an international point of view. So we wanted to, to be sure that uh, if people would look at these operations from abroad, they would see the sound movement from the Portuguese government. Uh, uh, so many countries, uh, many com uh, corporations uh, uh, competed in this uh, privatization program from Japan, from India, from Brazil. Yes. Not from the United States, I'm afraid. <laughs> at this, uh, and, uh, in the end, I mean, the best, according to our judgment, the best proposal was the proposal that they had presented. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we want them to become good business partners. And uh, we are not, so the matter had, I mean, reasons for concern had not, nothing to do with countries. They had to do with uh, the procedures and, and uh, in order to ensure the best revenue possible for the state and the best trans uh, transparent way, the most transparent way um, also. And that's part of that globalizing world that we live in, the, the mobility of capital and the, the nature of, of international investments. Now. And that's part of regaining credibility. Yes. Because uh, if there was one thing that uh, uh, it was affected uh, when we joined this program, we joined this program because our credibility was at stake. Uh, and I think that that's no longer the case at this point. And the, the privatization program are not only part of deleveraging the presence of the state in the economy, and I think that we have moved to from 48% of our GDP to 42% uh, in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, part of regaining our international credibility, and I think that that's a good indicator as well. What is it? Is there a common vision of Europe, or is, is that vision different depending on your your angle of vision, where you are in Europe, rich, poor, north, south? Well, I think that there is a common vision in Europe in the sense that the European Union, as I said uh, in the beginning of our interview, is not only deepening its ties, but it's also expanding. Um, now, uh, having said that, of course there are different perspectives, and I think that we are not a federal state. Many times in the United States people ask me, why don't you move faster or uh, in a different way? But you, you live in a federal state, and you have you see your, uh, how difficult it is sometimes. And we are not a federal state, uh, and so that means that uh, the decision-making process uh, is slower. Yes. And uh, we have uh, we are all democracies in the European Union. That means that our leaders everywhere are accountable. Uh, from time to time, they go to elections. And that's, uh, yes. We must test for any uh, any democracy, and so. Bearing that in mind, uh, I feel that the progress that has been made is remarkable uh, in consolidating the euro area. I believe that the euro area is very sound uh, at this, at, 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 as we speak, uh, and also uh, in integrating Europe in different ways. For instance, the freedom of circulation of people. Uh, that was one of the key issues during the last Portuguese presidency of the European Council uh, back in 2007. And the Schengen system, so-called Schengen system, that yes. allows us to operate. It's a remarkable uh, thing. I mean, not only a common currency, but the way you are able to move in Europe in these days. Yes. I still remember, as a, uh, a slightly younger person, <laughs> uh, when I had to go to Spain, I was 18 years old, and I had to stop at the border and show my passport in the Portuguese side of the border, and show my passport across the border, and my military license, because I uh, had to make sure that I was not fleeing from the, my military duties. Okay. And nowadays, if you move from Portugal by car to, say, Germany, you don't see any physical borders. I mean, uh, in there. Yes. Of course, we can reinstate them if we need uh, an emergency.
Mars is sister situation or something. But that shows you how deep your passport. Exactly. You know, I remember as a younger person, to use your phrase as well, how mightily disappointed I was as a young American traveling in Europe of when, all, when those borders began to disappear. I couldn't accumulate stamps in my passport at each, at each border course. That was, but that's, that's a remarkable proof of how different Europe is from the Europe that you and I knew as very young people. Well, it's easier to be pessimistic about Europe. But I think it's, it's probably sounder to be more optimistic about, yes. it's, it's, yes. uh, it's, uh, it's about its future, because it's there. And as long as we're talking about the future of Europe, let, let me touch on one issue that has persisted and, and crosses uh, not only physical boundaries, but crosses intellectual boundaries. And that is, what do you think is, is the future of Turkey as a potential member of the EU? Well, uh, Turkey is actually a, a candidate country of Europe. Yes. And uh, the Portuguese position, the, the, my country's position is quite clear. I mean, uh, we supported uh, them as a candidate country. And there are a number of requirements that the country has to meet if it wants to join us. Um, I mean, from the economic to the political uh, requirements. Uh, and of course, I mean, it's a slow moving process, uh, but a steady one. And uh, I mean, it has been the policy of different Portuguese governments, and not only this one, but different Portuguese governments, the consistent policies to support their status as a candidate country. So in, if in the end uh, of this process uh, they will meet all the requirements, they should be uh, treated as uh, a, a candidate that will become a member one day. So the, Portugal would not then support the the sort of cultural arguments that are made that, that Turkey is not a European country culturally, that because it's an Islamic well, country, it, it perhaps doesn't belong in Europe. No, on the contrary, we feel that uh, from a strategic point of view, it makes sense to, to Europe to have Turkey uh, as, as, a, as a full member. And of course, Turkey is a long time NATO member. Yes, a founding member and a frontline state also. Yes. Uh, as we talk about NATO, I mean, we, we, we look at their borders. They have borders with very difficult countries, including Syria, for instance. Yes. And um, and so we, we shouldn't forget that. But on the other hand, uh, we don't feel that Europe, uh, culturally speaking, is uh, just a club for uh, mem members of a uh, certain religion or uh, yes. sector. I mean, we, we are a diversified continent, and then we should uh, we should deal with the future in that way. Yes. You, you mentioned Syria, so let, let me just ask that question. One of the, the continuing issues, especially as NATO expanded and as NATO and, Europe and the EU, which are not completely overlapping, but as uh, issues of common defense policies and so forth began to emerge, operations of NATO have been more and more, quote unquote, out of theater compared to the, the old days of NATO when it was clearly a European alliance. We've seen NATO um, intervene in the situation in Libya. How, how do you think NATO and or the EU should be responding to a situation like Syria that has now dragged on for certainly more than two years? Well, I think that we have been doing what we have to do. I mean, the, the Portuguese position is uh, pretty much in line with uh, the European Union and the US position, yes. for that matter. And so we have been so Politically speaking, supportive of all, of all the measures that have been taken, uh, and so we are monitoring the, the situation, like the other uh, member states, uh, NATO and the European Union. And I think that uh, we we feel that, uh, of course, it's a very dynamic situation. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, the decision that was taken to send the Patriot missiles to Turkey was also an important one. But at this point, I mean the. the, the what we have done so far, we, and by we, we mean NATO and the European Union and, and the United States, uh, is fully in line with uh, the Portuguese view of this, uh, of this yes. process. And, uh, and of course, I mean, we have been saying that the status quo is not acceptable. Uh, that's quite clear. Mm -hmm. To take a situation that's breaking much, much more recently, um, we've seen, again, just about the time we're doing this interview, the beginnings of a French intervention in Mali. Do you think those kinds of, 
of interventions that are nominally uh, in the name of responses to terrorism, but, but clearly a new kind of, of response to sovereignty uh, or, or the absence thereof. Uh, do you see this as a continuing saga of, of needing to intervene in various places like Mali, like Yemen, uh, where, where the issue of Islamic violence uh, arises? On, uh, on this one, I cannot give you a straightforward reply for a very simple reason, because the Portuguese <laughs> government has not uh, taken a... Uh, and it's almost an unfair uh, question, because uh, it literally no, has happened express, in the last 48 hours. Uh, but having said that, I mean, uh, what I can safely say is that we have been working with uh, our partners um, in, um, in, uh, in, 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 on African issues, and of course, like other partners, we have been very worried and concerned, uh, including French as a partner, uh, with the situation in parts of West Africa. And, uh, and of course, terrorism, organized crime, uh, organized violence, uh, you can see a little bit of that spreading uh, everywhere. And uh, so, we, we tend to be uh, uh, supporting all of those in Africa, because if you look uh, at, uh, at what's going on in that area, you see that ECOWAS, also a regional organization, is also right. moving. Uh, and that's the, the right Which way. the economic community of West African yes. states, ECOWAS. So, uh, in that region of the world, for instance, uh, we look uh, at the situation of Guinea Bissau, uh, for instance, a Portuguese speaking country, and, uh, and uh, uh, with some concern. And uh, we, we want also to contribute to, 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 to stabilize the situation there and to restore democracy uh, and rule of law uh, in that country uh, as well. So we are using a different way to, to do that but, uh, because the requirements are different uh, in, in there. But we are working, so we are not indifferent to, to the situation in parts of Africa uh, from a security point of view, but the key issue, and I know that also to try to work with the African, the Africans themselves in yes. solving these problems. Okay. Let me, a very specific question to, to Portugal's history. There's long, deep uh, relations with Brazil, the, the largest Portuguese speaking nation in the world. Uh, how, does, how does Portugal see its relationship with, with Brazil? Uh, there's a lot of history there, but there's also a lot of a future there. What what is that relationship economically and politically? Well, it's, I think it's a very intense relationship. It's uh, uh, for us. I mean, I, I, I only can uh, explain the Portuguese perspective. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's, No, I'm not asking you to become uh, Brazilian. <laughs> but uh, for us, it's it's a, it's a very uh, a very important and unique case in so many ways. They are by far uh, the largest Portuguese and most influential. Uh, Portuguese speaking country in the world and uh, they, are, they are fast becoming a global power uh, themselves. A peaceful one, I must yes. stand online. Uh, and uh, I mean, the cultural ties that uh, link, link us to, to this are very strong. But not only, this is not a matter of history, it's a matter of the present. For instance, uh, if you fly between, between Europe and, and Brazil, uh, the number uh, of flights uh, going from Portugal is the uh, highest in all Europe, mm. uh, linking the two continents. This is a very practical one. You see yes. Brazilian investment flowing to Portugal. Embraer, uh, one of the biggest uh, aeronautical uh, corporations right. in the world, has just invested in, in, in Portugal. Um, Portuguese investment in Brazil is also uh, meaningful by, by our, our standards. So I would say that. Uh, we would not have any major differences with, uh, with them. Our capital city, Lisbon, was moved, I mean, the capital city of Portugal was moved from Lisbon to Brazil, to Rio. It's a, a unique case in history. During when Napoleon decided to invade Portugal, the king moved to, to Brazil. Mm -hmm. And also, the first king of Brazil, Peter I, afterwards became our king, ah. Peter I. So you see, <laughs> the history is quite unique. Yes, yes. Uh, if I would say, well, are, are there any problems? They are, there are. And of course, we'll have to beat Brazil for in the next World, world Soccer 
Uh, which is going to take place. Yes, the, uh, the politics of the World Cup is already weird. <laughs> For them, there is no problem. <laughs> well, that, that leads me to a kind of wrap-up question. And, and with each of the ambassadors with whom we've been privileged to speak, I try to wrap up the interview by asking a, a sort of two-sided question. And that is, what, what are your greatest concerns for the future of your country? And what are your greatest hopes for the future of your country? Well, I start by the hopes. I have a lot of hope in the future of my country. Otherwise, I wouldn't be representing my country uh, uh, abroad. Um, I think the biggest challenge uh, is how to make uh, our country a more, uh, from an economic and financial point of view, more competitive, more global, um, and also how to build the foundations for a more equitable society um, uh, in, 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 in Portugal. That's what we have been, we have been trying to do. Uh, and I think that we have been moving uh, reasonably well under the circumstances. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we're going to overcome this current situation. We have, been, we have seen uh, in our long history uh, very difficult moments. But if you look at the way <coughs> the Portuguese people have been reacting, and it's a very brave one, I mean, uh, very resilient. Uh, because we are part of the same family. It's a very, still a very homogeneous country, and uh, I think that, that that helps a lot. Uh, I don't believe that we have a problem of identity in mm -hmm. other places. Uh, we have probably a problem of excessive identity sometimes. And, um, and uh, uh, we, we have to use this challenge, this huge challenge that we are facing, to move forward. And uh, I, I believe that we are going to to, to move in that direction. And again, uh, also, as an ambassador to the US, uh, I have to fight stereotypes uh, uh, to show that Portugal is what it is, a modern country, a stable democracy. It's, cr it's crossed, it's facing some headwinds, but we are not ignoring them. We are fighting them yes. and moving ahead. And that's what we are trying to do. And I liked your use of the word brave. That's, that's not a word that we often hear used in conjunction with economics, but when it comes down to the impact of the, the kinds of programs, the kinds of budgetary constraints that you face, actually bravery is a very good word for the people in the street who are dealing with the consequences of those macroeconomic decisions. True, and, uh, and because, I mean, for us, the proposition between uh, fiscal consolidation or growth is a false uh, proposition. Uh, we need fiscal consolidation in order to ensure uh, that our economy will become more competitive. Yes. Uh, and so, uh, some mistakes uh, have been made and some mistakes will have to be corrected. Uh, how fast we can move uh, and how far and within which time frame, it's a matter of, uh, of political discussion. Uh, and again, I mean, if you are going to see people demonstrating, people expressing their views, in the parliament in a very lively way, but that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. It's part of our democracy. We do not want to abolish democracy, we want to abolish the crisis. Understood. <laughs> and, and that points, but let me just ask it pointedly, your, your greatest fears for your country? Yeah, my, my greatest fears, I mean, uh, I don't have any, I must <laughs> say that I don't have any particular fears uh, for my country. Uh, we, I mean, we are in a very stable continent. We, are, we only have a one neighbor, which is Spain, and it's a very, a very constructive and a very good relationship with, with, uh, with Spain. A friendly one, actually. We have another neighbor to the south, Morocco, yes. which is also a very stable country. So geography is not a matter of concern. As a matter of fact, it's a different way. We started the conversation by that uh, propaganda piece of paper that, yes, yes. that uh, I showed you. Geography is, is in, our, in our favor. We are a very educated uh, uh, people, uh, and so I don't fear uh, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. our future. I think that we are facing a challenge, uh, and we are going to have setbacks like everybody else, uh, but we move on. Yes. I'm pretty confident about it. Really. And many, many observers would say you know, that, that Portugal has, in fact, offered a model of a, of a balanced response to these, these concerns to this fiscal crisis that well, is to be admired uh, despite all the difficulties you've confronted. 
but it's difficult. It's uh, very hard for the, the people, <coughs> but uh, I'm part of people also. Yes. And uh, and uh, I feel my feeling is that we are very resilient. We'll move on. Yes. I'm pretty sure about it. Well, Ambassador Brito, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. You've been extraordinarily generous with your time and with your voice. I know that the combination of, of jet lag and fighting what you assure me is the Portuguese cold, not the American flu. Uh, you can you be reassured about that. <laughs> I was, I, you, I've, been, I was, I've been back to the country very recently, so it's uh, not touched by the American under, Understood completely. And let me thank you for joining us at Diplomatic Connection. We hope that you'll come frequently to our website and take time to listen to these very personal but very revealing interviews with ambassadors and other leaders of the international community here in Washington so that you can begin to see the diplomatic connections that knit this global world together. Thank you, and we look forward to being with you again soon.